So, um, yes, I'm Jane Daly um, and I'm the co-director of the Irish Theatre Institute with Siobhan Burke and I also work in a freelance capacity as a project manager, uh, kind of strategic planner and I do a lot of facilitation work with arts organisations. Hiya, thanks so for taking part in this. Um, so, I ask everybody the same question. When you were young, was theatre in your heart and in your life and was it something that you always felt you wanted to get into or, you know, was that child kind of destined to be involved in the entertainment industry? No. <laughs> end, end of interview. <laughs> not, uh, not remotely. Um, I was all about uh, history and museums. Um, I had a fasc fascination with myths and legends and tales. I used to, you know, do you remember that writer, children's writer, Patricia Lynch? Yeah. Uh, I, I used to just devour her books. Um, and so that was always my area of interest. Um, but when I was doing, I think it was in fifth year in school, um, I remember saving for, oh God, for probably about a year because there was a school trip coming up. Uh, to London and Canterbury to go to the theatre. The English, the English teacher was a extraordinary, an extraordinary woman and um, organised this trip and we were going to see the Scottish play, which was on the leaving for, on the leaving search the year I did it. And I had the privilege at the tender age of 16 and a half to see a young Vic production of the Scottish play with Ian McKellen wow. and Judy Dench. Wow. Um, and I remember sitting on the hard bench seats in the Young Vic and all my schoolmates, my classmates were all asleep around me because they'd had too many glasses of, or too many cans of Smithics on the ferry and um, were kind of sleeping it off. And I just remember that moment where I was spellbound um, the play made sense to me for the first time and um, Ian McKellen, uh, he was standing right there sweating and spitting and I was thinking this is, this is just extraordinary. So while I didn't immediately, you know, turn away from the kind of the history road I was going, um, it just was always percolating away in the back of my head that live performance was transformative. Had so been, it, it came out in the end. Had you been like, was was it in? Like, had you had an opportunity to kind of see stuff be, be, be before that? Like, was it kind of in your family? Had was the arts kind of around you at all? No, no, it wasn't really. Um, my mother, my mother played piano um, uh, when she was younger, and was kind of played in the feshes and the, all of those. And she and my dad used to go to the theatre all right, and she would talk about seeing Nicole McLeamor and. Siobhan McKenna and all the rest, but it was an occasional thing that they went and I wasn't brought, I, you know, I was never brought to a pantomime in my life. Um, we were more outdoorsy kind of family. So it, it kind of snuck up on me, but when, um, you know, I, I went through college and did classics and history and wanted to go down uh, the teaching route initially, um, when, I, when I did my dip, my H dip and taught for a year, I realised that that just wasn't wasn't for me. I couldn't stand staff room politics. <laughs> um, you know, secondary schools in the early eighties. You know, we were still in the days of streaming and referring to you know students as in being in remedial classes and things like that. And it just it just never sat well with me. And then um, an opportunity arose. You you're young enough to, to remember Anko. Yes. Um, which essentially was the precursor to FOSS, and they ran a, they ran a course um, uh, in arts administration, which nobody knew what it was. And I uh, applied to ANCO because I was an unemployed graduate, mm. and um, I got selected for this course, which was run by the Irish Museums Trust in conjunction with UCD and uh, ANCO. We got paid to do it, like a FOSS course, and um, that was the first arts administration program, which became the MA in cultural policy in UCD. Um, and I did that and that just kind of opened things up to me. Um, and 
what I thought museums were my my uh, future, um, the 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 theatre the, the theatre bug just got me, and I ended up taking that route. And I have to say, I've been incredibly lucky um, over the thirty six years that I thirty seven years this year, I think, that I've been working in the arts. And go back there to say Ian McKellen, because I mean that is a seminal um, version of that play. Um, and then you know, I suppose recognizing that there's something in you that kind of you know is drawn towards live performance. Um, well, two questions. A, was it ever something that you wanted to do yourself? Was it ever something that you kind of harped after kind of giving it a go yourself? And B, when you decided to like not do the, do the, the, the teaching, was that a big jump for you to do the arts at Um, I have never wanted to be front of house on terms of stage. I've never wanted to step on a stage and uh, pretend to be somebody I'm not. I, I, I just couldn't do it. I never had that um, desire. I, I always liked to be in the background. Um, I was always very good at organising things. Um, you know, if anything in the family, if people needed to organise something or if as friends growing up, if we were going to the movies or we were going away, you know, camping or something, I would always be the one to do the organising. So I kind of knew that I was good at that. So I never had any desire to perform. So I'm not a frustrated artist um, in that way. Um, although, you know, my, my partner might would kind of say sometimes, you know, I spend my life performing because I'm always, you know, you're always on, you know, when you're kind of in meetings and presentations and everything. So it is a, a type of performance. Um, but when the when the shift came for me from the kind of the the teaching no i knew instinctively i didn't want to really want to teach at certainly at second level but remember it was the days when in, i left i didn't leave in 1979 so in those days if for a young woman it was you did a secretarial course you went to the bank you know if you were from an ordinary family you, you know, kind of lower middle class, you'd go to a uh, the bank, you do the bank exams, you do the civil service exams, you would, um, nursing was an option and uh, air hostessing, but air hostessing, I couldn't qualify because I was too tall. So I, I exceeded the, I exceeded the quota for being an air hostess uh, and teaching. And uh, my dad, my dad always wanted one of his daughters to go to university and I was, I was it. Um, wasn't a place I loved very much, I have to say. Um, but I, I met a lot of great people there. But I wasn't a member of drama soccer or anything like that. I was off in the classic society, you know, going on archaeological digs and keeping my head down. And then when I went, we did the Arts Admin course, I met people from all art form disciplines. And um, I had some very good tutors on that course. And through that, it gave me my first step into paid employment in, in the arts, which kind of came, actually came through um, Mike Murphy, who was the, who, you, you know, is a broadcaster and a, a lover of the arts and a great champion of the arts. And he gave me my first gig on a, a festival that he ran in 84, the year the, the Dublin Theatre Festival was cancelled. Wow. I'll, I'll come back, just go back there for a second though, but the interesting thing for me is kind of the jump from yeah, okay, you didn't want to do the teaching, but what, what brought you toward the arts at, at Badlin course? Was it something that was kind of just hanging there for you? I think um, there was a little bit of me probably that always felt a little bit out of step with everything else. Um, a little bit of me that never really saw myself in a routine nine to five kind of environment. Um, I think I was a bit more free spirited than that. Um, and also, you know, when you're that age, you kind of don't really know what you want to do, to be honest. Um, and it was one of those things I saw it. I, I was absolutely convinced that I could be a museum curator because I would be around old things all the time and I wouldn't have to talk to anybody. Uh -huh. and I thought I could do that, you know, and there'd be loads of reading and researching. Um, and then, I, you know, as I went through it and engaged with people on the programme and was exposed to, um, I remember you know, the, one, one of the people we met, 
we went on a site visit to the Bell Table in Limerick. This was 1983. And um, Breach Dukes was running it at the time. And like talk about a dynamo, you know, and kind of went into this theatre space and Breach basically told us like it is, you know, warts and all. And I kind of thought to myself, oh, wow, you know, there's a bit of... Um, there's a bit of latitude here in terms of, you know, how you approach things and how you can do things. It's not all formulaic. And then you kind of meet more and more people. And actually it was uh, Dennis Classy's dad, uh, Louis Classy, who um, gave me uh, a great, an opportunity after I'd worked on the gig with Mike Murphy. He um, had just taken over the management of the Dublin Theatre Festival with Michael Scott as the artistic director. And they were looking for a programme administrator and I was lucky enough to get the gig. And I had left, um, I had met Lewis during the Arts Min course because he was one of the tutors and um, moderators. And um, he, gave, he gave me my start, you know, I suppose. Uh, and I, I got my first full-time job in the Dublin Theatre Festival in uh, 84, I think it was, 85, early 85. And that must have opened up you know, a whole new vista for you from like both obviously Irish and international working, I suppose different yeah. ways of thinking. And, and I think it's right to say, because I think it's, it's worth marking it, the fact of, you know, even though it's not that long ago, you know, in, in real terms, but it was a different country um, for, well, for everyone, but particularly for women, and particularly to say for women in work. Um, yeah. so it's been a hugely, coming from, as you say, a museum setting and, you know, with classical interest, going into the, like a Dublin Theatre Festival context must have been like extraordinary for you. It, it was, and it, it was hugely exciting though as well because it was a, a, a time of a whole change there. So I didn't um, go in and join a team that had been there forever. We were all new because um, there was no Dublin Theatre Festival in 1984. Uh, Michael's, Michael Colgan ha had gone to the gate so there was this, there was a kind of a hiatus and a whole new team was appointed uh, for the festival in 85. And um, so I was lucky I started there with other people who were in the same boat. So we, we kind of worked together and built a team. And it was a real eye opener for me. And I think as well, what I realized around my classical studies and my Greek and Roman uh, education at, in UCD was that I, I knew a lot about Greek theatre and I knew a lot about, you know, um, Roman, you know, literature and poetry. And I realised that actually I had a lot of knowledge about the evolution of theatre. And going into the Dublin Theatre Festival, I have to give great credit to Michael Scott, who um, pretty much taught me everything I came to know at the time about U European theatre, about what we used to call avant-garde theatre, about experimental theatre. And he introduced me to artists that I'd never heard of. Mm. You know, I'd heard of um, John B. Keane and Shakespeare and that type of thing. But he, you know, opened my eyes to people like um, Peter Schumann and um, Robert Wilson, you know, Casimir's Brown, all these people that I didn't know about. So it kind of just got the, it whetted the appetite and kind of once, once I was in there, I was hooked. Yeah. How long, how long, how long did you remain in, in, in that role? Um, for I did, I did, um, I did two festivals, I do two Dublin theatre festivals. Um, and then I moved to Glasgow uh, and I worked on a, a, a multi-art form, uh, multidisciplinary arts festival in Glasgow. Uh, called Mayfest, which unfortunately no longer exists, but it was um, it was an extraordinary festival, a, a multidisciplinary festival that used to happen uh, in around to celebrate May Day. It was a very um, Glasgow's a very kind of you know politically motivated city, um, and they had this big festival and was very big strong community aspect to it. Um, so I moved to Glasgow. Uh, I spent two years, two festivals there, and that was in the lead up to the Glasgow City of Culture. So I got extraordinary opportunities there as well, in terms of the work I saw and the artists that I worked with on the festivals. Mm. I think it's, it's interesting, and kind of, I'm going to get you to kind of, you know, 
not necessarily on, in a straight arc, but to kind of bring me through your, your career. Because I think that the, it's often, often spoken about that, like, you know, the artists and directors and designers and freelancers have this nomadic kind of, you know, change, you know, change for the career. But it's kind of, you know, unless you know people or unless you're kind of embedded in the, the industry, there mightn't be an awareness in the, in the general public or even in some corners of the arts about, about you know, your background and kind of the, the amount of different work that, that you've kind of done. I think that's worth kind of talking about that kind of, there's been a huge amount of variance, you know, even though you've been in the same industry, the kind of, is that something you seek out, Jane? Um, I think that's a good question. Um, I think so. I, I think so. Yes. I mean, I've always been the sort of person professionally, um, complacency is something that I can't really tolerate uh, because if you get complacent you get lazy and if you get complacent your standards drop and you start to take things for granted so um, I, I, I suppose I've always kind of worked on the basis that you're all, I'm going to be found out one day uh, do you know that feeling uh, yeah. <laughs> one of these days one of these days I'm going to be found out and um, it, I think it kind of keeps you on your toes. Um, and in this business, things change all the time. Policies change. Um, people running organizations change. Um, you know, uh, you, you have to be, as Siobhan and I would always use the term, uh, nimble and flexible. You need to be able to re respond. Um, and I think you kind of need to trust yourself and know yourself. I mean, you know, uh, like I haven't talked about working with Druid, but I I just knew instinctively um, that it was time to leave there, and I didn't have a job to go to. Yeah. Uh, so I left a full time job to go working freelance. Yeah. Um, because I just felt I'd no more to offer uh, mm -hmm. there, and I wasn't in the company. You know, I could have stayed there for whatever length of time and just done another show and another show and another show, but. I wasn't, I was no longer being stimulated by the work and therefore I don't, didn't feel I was doing it as well as I could. And did this come sort of in, in the time, just to get my head around the timeline, in relation to kind of the Glasgow and coming back from there, where, where is that? Sitting? Yeah, yeah, I came, I hadn't intended moving back to Ireland at all um, and I felt uh, at the time, this would have been around 1988, there was so much happening in Glasgow, moving up to the City of Culture, and I kind of thought there's so many opportunities there that I could see that maybe my next step was going in that direction. Um, I had no desire to move back to Ireland at that time. It was, it was the 1980s, for God's sake, you know, what was there to move home for? Um, but uh, funny the way things work, um, when I was working at the Dublin Theatre Festival, I got to know Druid because we brought conversations on a homecoming to the gate that year during the festival. And I got to know the company and I got to know Maureen Hughes in particular. And, excuse me, and then when I was in Glasgow, we brought uh, a production, Druid's production of the Factory Girls uh, to the festival in Glasgow. So I got to know the company. And um, lo and behold, uh, I really liked their work. I'd seen them a few number of times in the Dublin Theatre Festival. And remember seeing A Wood of the Whispering in the Dublin Theatre Festival in 1983. And... It didn't finish until I think about half eleven. It was three and a half hours long. I remember having to walk home to Ballymun um, because I missed the last bus. But um, the company's work had always really inspired me, and I and an opportunity arose. Jerome, um, the extraordinary Jerome Hines, who was a fabulous mentor to me um, when I took over at Druid, took over from him, which is not an easy thing to do. Um, I. Um, I've lost my train of thought. You were talking about the, I, the, the, the journey of coming back to Ireland and kind of not... not oh yeah, back. yes, sorry, yes. Jerome I w was moving to Wexford and suddenly the one company that I thought, crikey, wouldn't it be fabulous to work for them? Um, the job, a job arose and I, I fortunately got it. Maureen Hughes actually rang me to let me know it was advertised because I wasn't, you know, I didn't, wasn't keeping track of it at all. Uh, so I can blame her. But um, I, I, I got the job. I moved back to Galway, uh, to Ireland, moved to Galway. And I'm still in Galway 30 odd years later. Um, 
Because that's interesting, you know, um, yeah, I forgot to mention actually, you're from kind of just down the road from where I'm kind of sitting now in, in, in Axis, but that sense of moving from, from um, you know, from the Ballymun area into, excuse me, into college, into teaching, then into an ankle court, and then kind of internationally to, to kind of Glasgow via Dublin Theatre Festival very early. But then, as you say, kind of finding, yeah, that must have been an incredible time and an incredible daunting job, as you say, to follow Jerome kind of in that role. And yeah, that was, but, but, but very exciting, I'd imagine, particularly at, at that time, because there was, there was seismic shifts going on in Irish theatre around, around that time as well. Yeah, yeah, it was daunting. I mean, I think if I thought about it at the time, I probably wouldn't have done it. I mean, I was, I was 27 and, you know, I was general manager of Druid at 27. I mean, what, like, for goodness sake. Um, and, but I, at that age, you, you feel you can do anything. You're, you feel invincible, you know, and you're ambitious and you kind of think, oh my God, this, this is really exciting. And um, I knew I didn't want to live in Dublin. I just knew that. And, you know, the opportunity to move to Galway in the late 80s, um, and it was as fabulous as everybody said it was. Um, some people, some people come to Galway and it just doesn't click with them. Uh, for me, I just the minute I got here, I thought, "Oh my God, yeah, this is I kind of belong here." So I fell in love with Galway very quickly, and um, the environment of working in Druid and that team that I had the privilege of working with was just extraordinary you had to work very very hard and times were tough and you fought for everything you you got because it was you were in the provinces you know mm. um and you, you you did have to work very hard and you felt very isolated a lot of the time because you couldn't be around other practitioners and other companies but um it it worked for me certainly did and as i say when i left druid i i kept living in galway yeah, I mean, it's fascinating again, you know, and again, it's not that, that, it's long, that long ago, but, you know, those times, because I remember Galway back in, in those times and even Ireland back in those times, you know, there was, and it's an old cliche, but there was no mobile phones, there was no kind of social media, there was no, there was no, and even the way the arts theatre world was set up, you know, it wasn't, but by any stretch of the imagination, the way that it is now, um, and so the function in that kind of, I mean, Galway was the other side of the country, whereas now it's kind of a couple of hours down, down the road. But Jane, there's something interesting in what you're talking about um, in relation to, and I think you can really see it in your relationships with, say, artists now in your current um, role, say, in IT. There's a sense of um, empathy, let's say, that kind of, or an, under, or an innate understanding of that lifestyle or life choice. And that kind of is interesting because I think that's kind of a, an added string to anyone's bow who's seen as a, as a, a producer or a, a GM or an you just mean just can sense that there's been you know whether there's been wedges drawn drawn between or divisions made between the administration side and the artistic side, but I think there's a lot of people like you know and you'd be one of the one of the heroes in that in that arena actually. No, no, but in, in relation to being able to just be yourself and not occupying all those spaces. And I think that's, like when you said there about moving on, you made a decision because you weren't getting as much from the, the work and therefore you couldn't give that to the work. Mm. Mm. Um, and is that kind of, did that carry on from that? I mean, like, you know, so you're staying, staying in Galway and then moving on from, from Druid, which again, I just say, it must be a big decision because no matter how... how it was, yeah... It, it was a huge decision, but um, I'd, I'd got, kind of got about 30 odd shows under my belt at that stage. And um, I mean, it was funny the way it happened. I, 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 it had been building for a while and I, <clears throat> I just knew, I just remember I was standing in the, the, town, the opening night of the Town Hall Theatre. Um, the opening night of the Town Hall Theatre, the premiere of Mark McDonough's The Beauty Queen of Linan. And I was standing there watching the audience going in and I thought to myself, I don't think I'm ever going to do this again in this current role. And I, I handed him my notice a few days later. I just, I just did it. I was, I was kind of exhausted as well, probably. And I was, um, I'd been in Druid for eight years and I kind of thought, you know, what else am I going to do? So, so I 
stuck my neck out and I was very lucky. I had a lot of great supporters and great friends um, in the business. Um, I mean, Tony O'Dolly looked after me very well, you know, got me, you know, my first freelance gig after I left Druid, you know, so there were, there were things like that. I was very lucky that there were people who were champions for me. Um, but I, I, I needed to kind of find out exactly what it is I wanted to do again. Um, and then I started to do freelance work, mostly producing, um, organizing tours, um, yeah, producing shows. I worked very happily with Declan Gorman in Upstate on, on production. I worked with Don Lo Kelly. I worked with Liz Roach, uh, Rex Levitates as it was at the time. So I was kind of a, you know, a producer for hire, either executive producing or, uh, or creative producing. And I produced some work of my own. I also ran the Kilkenny Arts Festival for a year, one of the years down there, um, pretty much as soon as I left Druid. So um, I kind of did a number of things. And um, then that was going fine. But I felt after a while I was disconnected from the theatre business because I was doing kind of but it had gone into kind of consultancy stuff, which is a word that never really sits that easy with me. Um, so I decided to put my hat, put my my hat in the ring for another job, um, which was a one year contract um, to uh, be the drama officer in the Arts Council. So I don't know what I was thinking, but. Um, <laughs> Balaam Donlan, who is, you know, a hero of mine, the God rest him, was uh, another great champion, a great supporter of me, somebody who got me out of a lot of pickles when I was in Druid, when he was the drama officer of the Arts Council and said, don't tell anybody I'm telling you this, but this is how you should do that or whatever. So when Phelan was seconded into another position uh, to develop uh, the Auditoria project, I went in as the acting drama officer to the Arts Council for a year. And it brought me right back into it. I was seeing work every week, everywhere, all over the place. And I was learning all about policy. I was learning about how the Arts Council worked. I was looking, learning about, you know, government relationships and budgeting and finance and um, how companies worked from the funding side. And, you know, having meetings with company managers and artists, people who I, I had been on that side of the fence as a as a manager producer and so i got it to see it from the other side and that experience was invaluable and it probably was the spark i needed to work out how to get back into it but from the other side i needed to be around practitioners i needed to be working with artists and th and arts workers and that's it was a kind of at that point where siobhan burke and i came together because um um it was the time of i don't know if you remember that there was at one stage multi-annual funding for arts organizations and uh the theater shop as it was at the time was was awarded um multi-annual funding and when my contract ended in the arts council after a year um siobhan and i sat down and had a chat about whether there was a way we could work together and maybe grow something out of my experience and her experience and she had founded the theatre shop but there were much bigger ambitions for it there wasn't a resource organization for theatre at the time it was before um theatre form yeah so it kind of then it escalated and it's then you know you turn around 20 years later and you think how did I get here? You know, how did that happen? I love that phrase. It, it, it escalated. <laughs> um, go back there for a second. I think there's. I mean, I'm interested in in um, that move. It's kind of like it reflects. I mean, it's very easy to put kind of narrative on stuff. You know, you're looking back, but the move very early on in your life from you know the academic classical side into into the arts admin is nearly mirrored in a way by the move from the policy place and the arts council place and kind of that, you know, girding your loins in that way, kind of going, was it a kind of feeling or a decision kind of going, where did that come from that I want to work with creatives or I want to work with arts workers? Or I want, was that something that became very apparent to you? 
again? Yeah, I think when I was working, when I spent all those years working in Druid, um, the excitement I used to feel, much as I loved the, the team that was there all year round, the excitement when the, the casts used to start arriving for the first, on a Sunday night, for the first day of rehearsals on the Monday. And that, that, that time we always rehearsed in Galway. And you'd, everybody would meet up in the Keys Bar, you know, the night before the first rehearsal. Um, and it was always that extraordinary sense of anticipation. And I just got to work with some extraordinary actors um, and designers and directors and lighting designers, many of whom are still, you know, great friends. Um, and um, I, I suppose my time there and touring with, the, with Druid, touring the highways and byways of Ireland and also touring internationally, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the company of the, the makers, the performers, the creatives, and could see how hard they worked, you know, and how precarious their their work was that, you know, they were on the top, you know, on cloud nine in the middle of their 12 week contract with Druid or something, but knowing you could see as the last night would start to approach, there'd be, now what do I do? Um, so I kind of was very aware of the precarious nature of the work. And I think I always felt maybe I could facilitate or support that work in some way. And, um, I, I was I was lucky, kind of, Siobhan and I clicked and realised that we kind of had the same motivations around that and that the there was room to imagine things mm. and make them happen. And I always say to Siobhan, you know, I, I worry, you know, when I go on holidays or, you know, if I'm away from the office for a while, I'm always terrified coming back because I always think, how many ideas has she had while I'm gone, you know? And... Um, you know, but it's like that. You can, you know, you can imagine things, and then you can sit down with each other and say, "We could do that, maybe." You know, yeah. and the current, the, the current situation we're in, in terms of COVID nineteen. You know, we we came through the recession, and we're not we know we're back near where we were at the beginning of the recession in terms of funding. But we're this is worse, I think. Um, and if any, if if there was any time we needed to be imaginative and creative. Um, around artists and artist supports and opportunities and sustainability of their work and their their passion and, and creativity, it's now. Yeah, I think it's. I, I mean, I mean, I'm sorry, it's very probably stupid question, but did, did you know Siobhan before that? Did you? It did. Yeah. So, like, was yeah. that kind of something that was bub bubbling along, or you know, was it? Uh, no, no. I mean, we we met in 1984 um, when I was working on that festival. I told you about that Mike Murphy, uh, that kind of first gig I, I got. And Siobhan was flyering for Rough Magic, doing a show with players. And we, we met. That's when we met. And um, then when I was in the Dublin Theatre Festival, we got to know each other a little bit. It was always problematic. I don't know. If, you know, Rough Magic were doing extraordinary work and it was always problematic getting into the festival in those days, you know. Um, but Siobhan and I got to know each other. I was also, you know, front and centre in Project, mm. watching their shows. I saw, I mean, I just thought they were amazing. Some of the work I saw them do over the years is kind of just so memorable. And uh, we got to know each other but totally on a professional basis. We we didn't know each other on a kind of a personal level at all. And then when I came back and was in Druid, we were kind of peers because she was running a company in Dublin. I was running a company in Galway. Yeah. And we would exchange information. And, you know, if she didn't know something, if I didn't know something. And I suppose, uh, but it was at a, at a distance. Yeah. But I think we had a healthy respect for each other. And uh, we knew that we both had the same kind of challenges in running uh, a theatre company, running a production company. Right. I, and Jen, I, then, okay, I mean, there's 20 years then, and obviously you've done kind of, you, you, you both still kind of exist outside the orbit of ITI and all that's happening there. But, but those are early, I mean, the decision, first of all, to do it. And then, you know, I, I think it's interesting the way you say it escalated. Did that just kind of, because it seems, seems to me that you kind of hit something or kind of landed on something that you both wanted to do. There was a need for it. And then suddenly, and you are still here and growing it 20 years later because that need ain't going to go away. And if, if anything, it's going to, going to get larger. But did you get a sense of that at the very beginning? Um, in the beginning, we were very 
project oriented. So, um, you know, there was the theatre shop event that would happen <clears throat> every year. And, I, you know, that had been going for five or six years before I became kind of officially involved with, with theatre shop. So it was project orientated and it was also the time uh, start, the playography was a kind of a kernel of an idea at that stage. And that became a real priority for us to see how we could develop that idea of creating this kind of online catalogue of all, all new Irish writing, um, both to catalogue the work, but also to try and rejuvenate the repertoire and maybe to offer opportunities for producers of Irish work to look beyond the, the staple uh, repertoire that they were producing and maybe explore other opportunities. Also, it was a time where there was the beginning of the developments in kind of digital and uh, online information. And I would have to say that Patricia Quinn, who was the director of the Arts Council at that time in the early uh, noughties, she totally got what we were trying to do with that project and the using the online uh, platforms for it. So sometimes you just find that your ideas, they just land in the right place at the right time, that there's certain traction, that, you know, you hit the zeitgeist. Another time you could have a fabulous idea, but there's just no appetite for it. There's no traction at all. Um, but, um, and then you kind of, you build from that. And, you know, the, we were a theatre shop, uh, which became Irish Theatre Institute, was producing the Irish Theatre Handbook, yeah. which was, uh, you know, uh, people used to refer to it as, as the Bible, which of course now we'd have to call it some, something different. Um, be, but that essentially, the playography in some way um, supported the handbook. And then we thought, well, the handbook is all about supporting companies and artists. But what if you kind of broadened that out? And then you started to think about artist support ideas. And then what about if you had a building to do this in? So I kind of had, I was laughing, I was talking to somebody um, the other day, um, um, or this morning actually, <clears throat> I was talking to somebody and we were saying, we were the Irish Theatre Institute when we were sitting in a, you know, a kind of 12, 10 by 12 room in South Great Georgia Street with four of us working, you know, in a row. And we were an institute. I mean, how, how arrogant were we? <laughs> um, <clears throat> but it was the whole thing about space, having somewhere that actors and artists and makers could go and could access services. And Siobhan and I would have both been around in the 80s uh, when the Actors Centre was on uh, Bachelor's Walk um, there near the um, Hickney Bridge. And it was, it, it, you know, it wasn't that long lived, but it was uh, the sort of resource that you kind of thought something like that would be great to have, but with some formal programmes. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, we, we kind of grew it out of that. Um, now, our funding is really poor. We, you know, like we're not, we're not back at the level we were in um, 2008. Um, and the building that costs a huge amount of money. So it's a constant challenge for us to kind of keep things ticking over. And that's why we, we adopt a, a flexible management model while Siobhan and I share the job of director so that... Um, we don't become, you know, well, I mean, administratively heavy. I mean, we've, we have a great team in ITI, you know, with uh, Elaine Donnelly and Catherine Murphy and um, Lee Hussey. And we've had great people before, you know, Paula Shields and Jen Coppinger and Claire O'Neill and Eva Sanger, all these fabulous people. And um, we could do it, maybe some men in the organization. I mean, it's exclusively female. Um, but having said that, yeah, our gender quota is really poor, by the way, really poor. But um, we we kind of, we're all the time trying to think about how can we expand, how can we develop further? I mean, one of the biggest challenges we have is the fact that our building is not universally accessible. And that's a huge problem for us because that means that there are people, uh, theatre makers, writers, artists, who cannot access, physically access our services. And so that leads us to the question of, are there, is there extra space that we could access? So we're all the time looking and talking to people about maybe finding uh, additional space, space that does have the kind of access and we, where we can provide the supports that uh, others can access e e easily. So everything, you know, it's a beautiful building, but it's an old building. 
And so we're, there are all these things going on at the same time. What do we imagine ITI would look like in 2025? What yeah. will it be in 2030? Yeah. So again, it's back to that thing of, you know, complacency. There's no room for complacency because you have to all the time be trying to work out how to meet the next challenge and the demand that we, that's placed on the services. I think it's interesting that you seem to have found, you know, that fluidity within a structure that you seem, you know, you kind of, it seems to be that fluid space that you can not freelance within a structure, but that like, you know, the organization is growing and moving and mutating with both yourself and Siobhan's, you know, dialogue together, but then also with the rest of the team and within the, the industry and the artists as well. That must be a really interesting space to occupy because, you know, it's one, it's kind of, you know, it's an organization that has shifted so much. Not, I don't mean it in relation to its mission or anything like that, but just in relation to it, it moves with the requirements of the theater resourcing. Do you mean it, it, is, it is a resource? Mm -hmm. And that would be kind of very ex exciting and in some ways difficult to, to kind of manage as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, it can be difficult. I mean, the biggest problem we have is that we, you know, We've built a community of, of artists over the, the year between the, rate, the the different programs we do, you know, at Six in the Attic and Show the Bag and Prime and Elevator and that. But, um, and so we have an alumni of <clears throat> about nearly 150 artists that we are constantly in touch with. But there are so many other artists that we want to reach and that we want to be able to provi provide the supports for. We don't want to at all never to be seen as like that we're exclusive or a closed shop or anything like that. Um, but our reality is that our, our resources are, are limited. So we have to find uh, clever ways of deploying those resources in the best way we can. I mean, the biggest challenge for us is, you know, we'd, we would really like to be able to do more kind of nationally. Um, and I'm very conscious of that as somebody who's originally from Dublin, but has, hasn't, I haven't actually lived yeah. permanently in Dublin since the mid 80s and um, the challenges for artists working outside of the capital are uh, significant so we, we'd love to be able to roll out a range of initiatives um, you know across the country and maybe not permanent in a place but maybe you could kind of do um, you know kind of interventions in different places um, and living in Galway I see that all the time with the artists that that I know living and working here but people who they want to live in the west they want to make work in the west but so many of them end up having to leave because it's just not sustainable and it's it's bad enough if you're living in dublin you know and obviously because as well you know competition for work is probably even even higher but you know you're never going to satisfy the needs of everybody um, but as long as the services that we're providing and the programs that we're providing are being accessed by artists we we will continue to do them if though we see shifts in policy or shifts in the environment and um, that's why what happens out of this current crisis is so important and um, we need to be able to design responses to meet needs and we need to be in dialogue with artists to inform us about what those needs are and not assume that we know what they are. I mean, ITI does not claim to know everything. Mm -hmm. um, but what we do well, I think, is I think we listen well, and I think we try to find, not we can't always find solutions, but I think we, we do try to find appropriate supports mm -hmm. for artists um, as a response to that. That's, I mean, that's an incredible creative process, what you've just outlined there. You know what I mean? I think that's kind of, yeah, I need saying, I mean, that kind of is a, a creative engagement with a sector and with a, a sector of, of individuals. And I think that that is really interesting in the space that, well, I mean, for those who are going to find this somewhere in depth of the internet in 20 years' time, this is uh, being recorded at the end of April when we're all in lockdown due to the COVID pandemic. But I think you're right in, in the sense that there's opportunities within this time to reframe and to think about, even, even to have the thought process of reframing. Um, but can I ask you, in relation to during that time ITI is growing, but also you obviously were working as well in there on different projects outside that. And was mm -hmm. there, 
was there stuff that you were seeking out around the, around the, through those years, Jane, or was it kind of you know was it was it particular types of work that interested you? Um, well, it started off before before I kind of came back in into the the ITI uh, space. Um, it was mostly producing and mostly um, touring work, project management, largely theatre or dance related. But when I became involved in uh, ITI, I kind of had to step back from the the theatre because it was a conflict of interest. You know, on the one hand, I'd be you know advocating for and supporting arts, and on the other hand, then I'd be kind of going working for them. Yeah. Um, I I <clears throat> I didn't I haven't actually produced a show of my own in many many years, um, and the last one I produced was with the fabulous and uh, dearly uh, missed Monica Frawley um, for a project did in the Galway Arts Festival, um, uh, and uh, written by Vincent Woods, um, so it would have been my last independent creative producing project. What I started to do after that was I started to do a lot of work with uh, local authorities um, on kind of st uh, strategic planning and arts funding. Um, I did a lot of organisational reviews for art centres. So I got more into that kind of space around strategic planning and um, the kind of reviewing organisations, um, organisations, performances and revisiting kind of missions and making sure working with them to see if they were still on track. So I did quite a bit of that. And then I took another notion, um, where you have those kind of crises and you think, I'm, I think it was when I turned 50 and I thought, I, I don't know if I want to be working in the arts anymore. Um, maybe I really am a closet teacher underneath it all. So um, I had got involved in uh, literacy tutoring, volunteer literacy tutoring here in Galway. And I decided then that I'd go back to uh, college. I go to, I did um, the uh, diploma through um, Waterford Institute of Technology on uh, literacy development. So I did that over three years kind of, you know, in my spare time, because I thought I wanted to get into adult education. Um, and this was kind of post-recession as well, and there was a bit of fatigue. Uh, also, I think I wanted to stimulate my brain, but I was very conscious of the power, the power of words, and um, that whole world interested me. And uh, then I just kind of realised, uh, actually, my father became ill, and I, I, I had to step back from a number of things for a while. Um, and then other things changed, and I never got back to my career in adult education. Um, which is probably as well because I'm actually pretty happy doing what I'm doing. But um, that program uh, that I did, that that pro that training program was extraordinarily useful in terms of the skills I learned that I could apply. And one of them was around group dynamics and facilitation. So I did uh, the facilitation training and. So I started to facilitate meetings and uh, strategy sessions for arts organisations, which um, I, I really enjoy doing. Um, so that became my kind of little freelance sideline. Um, and I, I, I still do, good, well, not doing an awful lot of it at the moment, obviously, but that's how I kind of try to generate the rest of my income, and uh, the other half of my salary. The, there's a number of things there. And I won't keep it for much longer, but the the sense of yeah, the sense of energy that you kind of display in, in, even when, when you're talking here and being around you um, through your work is extraordinary. And I think that is there, are, are there touchstones for you, uh, not necessarily work that you've seen, but times that you go whoa, like the, like the Ian, Ian McKellen moment, you know, it, like the, yeah. the about your career, you kind of go oh fuck, that's why I'm doing this and or the way she looked, whatever. Have, have there been moments like that you can kind of think of the top of your head that kind of went there, that's amazing? Yeah, um, yeah. God, there have been so many of them in, in, in many ways. Um, I mean, I remember, I remember seeing Portia Coughlin, you know, the first time I saw Portia Coughlin, I thought, was less about the, it was less about the, I'd seen the May already, but when I saw Portia Coughlin, it was less about the, the performances which were all fabulous but it was the sound the words 
the dialogue and I thought, oh my God, this is the most extraordinary thing I've heard. I don't know if I even understand what I'm hearing. Um, and then your ear becomes attuned in a way, I thought it was really kind of spectacular. Um, there are kind of memorable performances. It's funny, Brian Dennehy died last week or, and I remember going into the Abbey to see um, The Iceman Cometh mm -hmm. uh, when Bob Falls directed that and Gary was the artistic director at the time. And I remember the performance was five hours and 10 minutes long and it felt like it, it happened in about half an hour. And, you know, there, there are moments, I mean, the amount of work I've seen over the year. I remember seeing, I, I've never seen a tiny show in Edinburgh years ago um about gerald Hauptmann, the the man who uh supp supposedly kidnapped the Limburg baby and it was a one-man show in the in the assembly rooms at 10 o'clock in the morning and i just remember sitting there thinking the privilege to have been in that room with that actor um, i have the program upstairs somewhere i can't remember his name but um to be in that room for that person for an hour and I think it's, I, I admire the craft so much. And I admire what it takes to make a show. Um, the design, the direction, the whole thing. And, I, and the, the, the writing. But I think one of the things that worries me at the moment is that not every actor, designer, director is a maker. And a lot of the talk we have you know, like the Arts Council COVID response uh, fund, it's geared towards makers, people who are comfortable and confident and sure in making their own work. But there are a lot of artists in the theatre sector who don't make their own work and don't want to make their own work. They want to work collaborative with, collaboratively with other people. And I worry that we might exclude people. Um, never mind how do we actually make supports accessible for arts workers, people who are, you know, technicians, um, you know, who are stage managers, production managers. So we need to be, we, we need to be cognizant that, you know, we talk about theatre is an art form, that every cog propels the next cog forward. And we have to be aware that we can't we can't focus entirely on just one area of our sector. We have to be providing opportunities across the board for people, the people who want to make, the people who don't want to make themselves, but want to be part of the making process. So for me, you know, I can, I can think about so many uh, moments that I've had in a theatre that have kind of propelled me into the next theatre I've also had moments in the theatre that I have said, I'm never getting that back. And, you know, you know, we all have had those. Um, but I do have a rule of thumb, I won't leave during a performance or at an interval, even no matter how bad it is. I, I just can't bring myself to do that. And I also have one other rule that if I hear people saying that a particular show is absolutely awful, I will go and see it deliberately to make up my own mind because theatre is such a subjective art form that your opinion is not necessarily going to be my opinion. And I think generally there's something in a production, even if overall the thing isn't working and hasn't worked, there is generally something in there to positive to take away from it. And people didn't set out to make a bad show as we've heard people say before. So I think there's a, a, a kind of an element of respect, you know, we need to, we need to expose ourselves to all sorts of theatre because if somebody makes a bad show now, they could be making the best show in the world five years down the road. Mm. So it's just, you know, to be open minded about things. I think that's, there's a couple of brilliant points in there. And I think you mentioned the word a number of times throughout this conversation is that whole idea of craft and trade and the craft around, because I remember when I was, leaving college, you know, in the early 90s or the early to mid 90s, there was kind of a feeling of, you know, you couldn't do everything. You couldn't have different skills. You had to have the one skill. You had, you had to be a writer. You had to be an actor. You had to be. Um, and then the journey from there to, say, the last decade where, you know, it's you kind of through, like, post-depression or post-recession, you have to be able to do 
it sometimes seems you have to be able to do everything but I think there's a bit lost in that journey in relation to those those, those cogs because you know there's a sense of you mentioned all those performers and you know shows back in the, in the 80s and 90s yeah you're kind of part of of a whole and I think that's there's a real sense of us having to protect that as an industry and um, it's to do a work of scale it's to do with work of large cast it's to do a work of you know, working with all those different component parts. And yeah, it's kind of an interesting dilemma that, that um, we face, I think, as an industry. But also you said there's something, I, I'm fascinated to ask you a question, but did you, did you ever think of directing yourself? Say that again? Did you ever think of directing yourself? Did you ever? No. No? No. No, no I'm, no. No, just because the way you're talking there, just it. The under, I think you have an innate understanding of the actor. You just get, get a sense of that, that off you. From a producer's perspective, maybe, but I wouldn't inflict. I wouldn't inflict me on a on a on a rehearsal room, Mark. <laughs> really? <laughs> no. Your your facilitation and mediation skills wouldn't come into play there, Jane. No. Um. I, mm, no. <laughs> I move on. I just, I just don't have that skill. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, no. And can I ask? And I'm not. Yeah. yeah. Go on. No, no, go on. No, I was just gonna say. I think you know, there is a role in theatre for people to produce and administrate and manage. Uh, it's a legitimate role in the theatre sector in the art sector. Um sometimes things wouldn't get done un unless those people were there. Um, and it does frustrate me when I, I hear people saying that, you know, all the money is going to administrators and that, you know, the reality is people are not earning huge amounts of money, you know, I mean, <sighs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a tricky one, but I, I, I can't apologize for, you know, having made my career on the management side. Um, and yes, I've been lucky. I've been pr primarily been in employment, either employed by a company or generating my own income through freelance work. But any business needs managers, needs people who can organize things. <laughs> and um, I, think, I think we are, uh, um, the, the world that I come from, my area of the profession, I think we're, I think we're an important part of the overall theatre ecology. Um, and I think particularly as well there, what you were saying though about say the evolving nature of both your work, you know, on a personal level over the, over the last number of years, but then with yourself and Siobhan and ITI, I mean, they are, I think, you know, anyone that's been around you um, would see that there's that level, and I use the word again, that, that empathy around or an empathy or an under understanding of, of around what is required as human beings to work within the industry. See, I think that's, and that's a different level of, of management altogether. That's actually listening and taking, yeah. someone, uh, taking somebody at, at face value. So it's not the actor, you're, you're, you're talking to the person. Yeah, I think, I think I suppose, I won't speak for Siobhan, but I know I've made choices over the years in terms of, you know, there may have been jobs that have come up that I, could have gone for um but i chose not to um because the work that i was doing i i was enjoying um, and i felt it wasn't finished do you know and uh, now what will happen in the next couple of years who knows yeah. you know not getting any younger and um but i think that that's been something throughout my career i i kind of know that that moment when that moment comes i kind of think there's a shift needed here or another way of looking at something um yeah but uh, you know i i don't know where the years have gone to be honest with you uh, you know it's that's a kind of frightening but it's, it's frightening yeah i i i know how you feel but it's also a very good thing that you kind of happened or you say yourself in the beginning of this chat you know that it's not about complacency. It's not about, it just, it hasn't slid by, by complacency. It's slid by, by, by constant reinvention. Mm. Mm. Keeping on your toes and, there, and, and making sure that nobody ever does find out in the way, you know, <laughs> Come here, keep I, fooling them. 
on that note, I'll say thank you very much, um, Jane, for taking part in this. It's been an absolute pleasure, as always, to kind of chat to you. And I look forward to maybe visiting Galway. Jesus Christ, the idea of visiting Galway is like an amazing thing right now. No, I know. I, th I think, I know you love it here. I mean, the big, my, I'm so disappointed for the Galway 2020 yeah. uh, program. All of those artists who have worked so hard, some of them for kind of four or five years nearly, um, and were this close to delivering projects they felt were unimaginable and would never happen. And my, I, my heart goes out to the likes of, you know, Galway Community Circus and the Blue Teapots and Motness and, you know, the visual artists, Louise Manafort and all these people who are making work that, that close. And I think there's, I think there's going to be a, a really important moment we're going to take, and Siobhan and I have talked about this with the, with the rest of the team in ITI, that recognition of grieving the loss of opportunity. Yeah. And that, that it's, it, they're gone. These things are gone and can they ever be, be replaced? So we need to, as a sector, really mind ourselves and mind each other. And not just when we come out of lockdown, but onwards for the next considerable length of time. Um, just keep, keep your, our ears and eyes open for each other. Jane, thanks so, so much. Been a pleasure and I'll talk Thank to you. Thank you, Mark. No worries. Always a pleasure talking to you. Take care. Okay. Nice stuff.